People around the world were transfixed by the images of protesters in Sri Lanka filling the streets and storming the president's house in early July in the capital of Colombo, forcing President Gotabaya Rajapaksa to flee the country and resign. In the immediate wake of Rajapaksa's resignation, MPs in parliament elected Sri Lankan Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe to become interim president. This move has continued to stoke anger and resentment among many Sri Lankans who were calling for Vikramasinghe to resign a month ago along with President Rajapaksa. Many in the country understandably suspect that Vikramasinghe's presidency will serve as a continuation of the same disastrous governmental policies, corruption, and power consolidation that, coupled with an extreme economic crisis, prompted masses of people in the country to hit the streets in dramatic fashion and demand immediate change. It remains to be seen what changes will or won't come for Sri Lanka at the governmental level. Although President Vikramasinghe has signaled his intention of squashing the protest movement, and the global vultures from the IMF are already pushing to restructure Sri Lanka's economy. Meanwhile, everyday people in Sri Lanka are still suffering greatly from inflation, supply shortages, the collapse of the national economy, and continuing political and ethno-nationalist strife. In this two-part series, we take a deep dive into the crisis in Sri Lanka, the long roots of that crisis, from the colonial period to now, and what the economic, political, and cultural conditions of this crisis mean for the lives and daily realities of working people in Sri Lanka. In part one, I spoke with Professor Nira Vikramasinghe from Colombo about the post-colonial history of Sri Lanka, the 30-year civil war, and the deeper historical context needed to understand Sri Lanka's current crisis. In part two, we look more closely at the lives and daily struggles of Sri Lankans living and working through that crisis, as well as the conditions that led to it in the decades following the end of the Civil War in 2009. I had the honor of speaking with Maithri Jagathisan, Associate Professor of Anthropology at Santa Clara University and a cultural anthropologist whose research focuses on gender, labor, minority politics, and development in the Global South. Professor Jagathisan is the author of the book Tea and Solidarity, Tamil Women and Work in Post-War Sri Lanka. Here's my conversation with Professor Jagathisan, recorded at the beginning of August, just after a parliamentary vote named Ronald Vikramasinghe the new president of Sri Lanka. Well, Professor Maithri Jagathisan, thank you so much for joining us today on The Real News. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. Well, you know, I, I have to say that, um, you know, Sri Lanka is not, you know, an area that I um, have known a whole lot about. Um, you know, back in my former academic days, uh, you know, I was a Latin Americanist focusing mainly on Mexican politics. So this is quite far afield from what I'm used to. And I just yeah have to say up top um, that your book, Tea and Solidarity, Tamil Women and Work in Post-War Sri Lanka was um, a really beautiful book. Um, and it was just jam-packed, uh, full of, you know, humanity and history and analysis that has really helped me kind of make better sense of, of what's happening in the country right now. So I'm super excited to get a chance to talk to you and to kind of build on uh, part one of this special series where I spoke with Professor Nira Wickramasinghe and we gave kind of a, a as broad um, but as, as meaty of a historical overview as we could in the time allotted. And I thought that um, kind of complementing that with uh, an interview with you to talk about you know, what is going on in Sri Lanka, what the roots of today's crisis are, but using those same kinds of ethnographic lenses and, and, you know, analytical questions that frame your book, I thought would give us a really helpful uh, way to understand on a more fine grained, you know, grassroots level, what folks in the country have been going through, um, how we should make sense of the sort of human yearning behind the protests and 
rage that that we are seeing in videos circulating on the media and on social media. So once again, I'm just I'm super grateful to you for taking the time to chat to us. And uh, I'm excited for folks to get to know more about you and your work. And, you know, I I figured um, before we kind of really wade into your book, I wanted to actually start part two of this uh, Real News deep dive on the crisis in Sri Lanka by asking you the same question that I asked um, Professor Wick Ramasinga in part one. Um, You know, I wanted to start by, you know, uh, just kind of asking if you could help us sort of frame you know, the uh, economic and political crisis unfolding in Sri Lanka right now and, you know, in your view, the historical path that led us to this point. So I guess like just in a sort of broad sense, how would you describe to viewers and listeners who are who don't know a whole lot about Sri Lanka but are seeing, you know, the news coming out uh, of Sri Lanka right now, how would you describe what's happening and, you know, what essential context do you think people need to have to make sense of what they're seeing. And, you know, for that matter, what do you think folks, especially here in the West, are not seeing right now? Yeah, it's a, good, it's a great question, especially the last one, I think, you know, and as Nira shared as well, you know, um, right now Sri Lanka is experiencing a dire economic crisis um, fueled by political decisions. Um, and, you know, the severe food, fuel, and the medicine shortages are the one kind of, you know, component that's getting a lot of attention, obviously, because of the IMF coming in, because of, um, you know, the larger conversations. But, you know, this, as, as many have pointed out, um, you know, that this is a kind of economic crisis and depression that's a long time coming. And it's based on decades of political kind of decisions that were driven towards wealth accumulation and extractivism, um, the plantation sector being a very key kind of piece of that. Um, And it was made by not only the Rajapaksa government, but successive ethno-nationalist governments, um, majoritarian governments that were not thinking about the minorities in the country in terms of their grievances, but also, you know, the types of policies that were kind of um, layered through from the 1970s onwards with the opening of the economy, really maximizing profits for the most wealthy. Um, and, And then in the kind of other part of that, there were centralizing of power in the executive presidency, which was kind of taking up the news, which is what we're seeing, right? People calling to abolish the executive presidency, but the wealth component of that, Um, And the promises of the Rajapaksa government to kind of promise this kind of mass post-war infrastructural development, promises of wealth, tourism for all, was not actually for all, right? It was kind of being slotted towards only wealthier classes. Um, And then they spent well beyond their means. And so they they made all these promises, spent well beyond their means, but they also hoarded um, well beyond their means as well. Um, And so the government went into severe debt and then all the, you saw the kind of foreign reserves plummeting and, you know, they did all of this rather than hold themselves accountable to kind of what happened at the end of the war, which was, you know, the disappearances, detentions of minorities, and then following the war, a kind of intense campaign against Muslims. And so we see these kinds of, you know, the the, the former regime, the Rajapaksa regime, was kind of facing these really egregious human rights violations and, 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 you know, really what we're kind of on an international scale getting attention, but at the same time being kind of um, really just stuffed below the surface and people saying, oh, it's great. Tourism is opening up again. The war is over. Sri Lanka is ready for its close up, as Condé Nast said in a tourism, you know, brochure. And it's on these like, you know, top 10 ratings for places to go. And so, but then there were still disappearances that were unresolved, um, you know, arbitrary arrest, detention, And the Prevention of Terrorism Act was still kind of, you know, the residuals of it were still lingering. Um, And so we're seeing that right now. And I think that's what's what's scary about it is that, you know, Nira, you know, mentioned this in her interview that people were focusing on the chaos of the protests, um, these kind of spectacular images of the president's office, the pool and so forth. Um, Some horribly in the Western media were likening it to the January 6th Capitol 
attacks, which was the you know complete opposite, <laughs> you know, because this was a, a protest that really was about struggling to survive. Um, people were dying in lines, you know, to you know healthy healthy people were dying in lines out of dehydration and exhaustion because they had to wait for three days to get gas cylinders to cook their food with. Um, and you know, this is the kind of you know. It, getting to that point of desperation where people had nothing other than to do than to demand to say, we are going to die. We are going to, we are suffering. Right. Um, and it was very clear where the wealth was um, and it was found. Right. Um, and so I think what's troubling to me is that, um, you know, I wish more, more of the media would focus on that robbing of the wealth of the people um, the kind of disintegration of the welfare state. And and really, you know, I think the most telling part of this all in the last couple of weeks is, you know, obviously when the Rajapaksas, each brother was leaving the country, you know, I think it was Basil Rajapaksa um, who's, you know, in the government, right, um, but spent 5.3 million rupees in cash on six business class tickets to Washington, D.C. to leave the country. And he's a U.S. passport holder. Um, and, you know, and I think about this more in the context of, you know, my own work, because just last year, tea plantation workers, you know, finally fought and won the battle for a thousand rupee daily wage. So $5.3 million in cash paid for business class tickets, yet we can't, you know, workers cannot get a thousand rupee daily wage, which is not a living wage, right? Um, so I think it's telling, and I wish more people would see that kind of massive inequality of wealth that's really at stake in the in the current protests and and in the the people struggle yeah i uh we have we have quite the um you know perpetual blindness when it comes to things like that a very a very willful and self-imposed blindness in fact um which leads us to really i think collectively misunderstand um the kind of political uh, sentiments in our own damn country, let alone those in in other countries, right? It's like it's like someone took the chip out of Americans' brains that's a lot that allows us to see uh, class antagonisms, <laughs> and um, you know, it's it's again like why um, I value your work and Nir's work so much because you really do uh, weave that into your analysis and you take you know the it very seriously. Not just, you know, like in terms of understanding, right, in, say, the post-war period after 2009, how different um, people and ethnic groups, you know, struggled for a sense of belonging and identity within the kind of national Sri Lankan project uh, after the Civil War, but also just like, you know, how people are struggling for dignity and um, a good life and the ability to live, you know, like uh, 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 and, and, and work without kind of constantly worrying about where your next meal is going to come from. And I wanted to kind of, you know, move in that direction, right? Because as an ethnographer, you know, there's such a deeply tender and I think human focus to your work. And, you know, in so many parts of your book, Tea and Solidarity, you know, these big, broad and even monstrous historical forces shaping Sri Lankan society kind of radiate outward from these, you know, really, you know, moving portraits of and, and interactions between working people, you know, between family and community members. And, you know, it's from these intimate spaces at home or at work or when people stop and talk to each other on the street that you show, you know, in your book how so many seemingly mundane moments and interactions are actually soaked with meaning and nuances that can actually tell us a lot about life in contemporary Sri Lanka if we actually kind of listen Attentively, so I'm I'm actually taking some inspiration from your uh, approach here and kind of structuring this conversation around certain pointed moments in recent history, many of which you you write about in the book itself. And you know, I figured that the best place to start is where you yourself um, start the book in the preface. You know, you you start by describing sitting in a hospital in Colombo in May of 2009. 
watching news about the death of Velupilai Prabhakaran, uh, the leader of the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, which signaled the end of the nearly 30-year civil war. So for, for viewers and listeners, I was, I was wondering if you could just sort of take us back to that moment and describe what the feeling was for you and for others around you as you watched that unfold. Yeah. There were so, I was feeling so many emotions. Um, You know, I think my great uncle had had a stroke um, and we were, you know, feeding him and kind of visiting him in the hospital. And, and it was in um, Velavata, which is a suburb of Colombo that's primarily, um, you know, where Tamils live. And so, you know, later that day, we were kind of after the hospital. I remember we were walking to the Velavata market to get some vegetables and, you know, young men were lighting firecrackers on the sidewalk. And I remember jumping. I remember jumping because that sound of firecrackers was terrifying, um, you know, partly because, you know, in April 2007, my grandfather had passed away. It was the last time that I had gone to the North. Um, and it was very difficult to get to the North at that point, the war had resumed. And I just remember falling asleep to listening to airstrikes and bombs falling in the Vanni, which was not in Jaffna, but kind of South of Jaffna. And I knew people were dying. I knew people and the airstrikes were happening. I knew there was fighting going on. And, and it's, you know, so People bear that history in their in their in their walk in their in their neighborhoods, right? And so to kind of hear that at that moment, I had a kind of pit in my stomach because I had no idea what was going to happen. And I imagine many minorities at the time in Sri Lanka were terrified and did not know what was going to happen. Um, and I think it was not that you know they had an idea of the repertoire of the state of state violence very much clear, but. It was a kind of opening. There was a possibility. But at the same time, there was a disciplining of minorities at that particular moment. People were holding their bodies in particular ways, saying things that would not be too revealing or too, um, you know, questioning. So people would be suspicious of where you stood because the government very clearly said, if you're not with us and with the nation, you're against us. And, you know, we've just clearly shown we are militarily, we've defeated the, the, the against, right? Um, so what was terrifying, I think, of that is that this idea of the nation, this idea of a single a majoritarian nation saying you're against us, um, and now defeated, right? Um, Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam that had a very different idea of a Tamil nation that was equally exclusive, right, um, in terms of um, you know, in terms of the way that they would kill anyone who would dissent against them um, in terms of their nationalist aims and principles. So it's like, what were the alternatives, right, um, for people like Hill Country Thummels that were not included in that in that vision for the LTT that are not included in the majoritarian nation? Um, so this idea was it was it was terrifying, you know, and it was very much like what now? Right? It was very blurry <laughs> in, in, in a sense, like very much like we didn't know what was going to happen, right? Yeah, I can I can genuinely only imagine. And, you know, I think like people watching and listening to this, you know, are are hopefully kind of getting a fuller sense from part one of this um, you know, conversation to to now, um, you know, of that ethnic diversity um within Sri Lanka and and kind of how these sort of tensions and antagonisms and solidarities sort of play within that that like you said that my majoritarian kind of claim to the nation uh, I was wondering if just like just to make sure that that folks kind of have you know a, a, a firm basis before we move on to talking more about your book if, if you could just say a little more right about those kind of divisions within Sri Lanka that maybe folks aren't seeing or hearing about as they uh, watch these um, events unfold now? Yeah, I mean, you know, so the, the, the country itself is, is multicultural, and it's multi-religious and multi-ethnic, um, you know, and it's things that Nira had maybe referenced to in the inter in her interview is that, you know, there's a deep kind of colonial kind of layers of history that kind of contributed to that multiculturalism, but also a kind of um, what Sharika Tharanagama calls a kind of neighborliness too. People knew how to interact with one another, um, you know, to kind of negotiate um, ethnic difference and so forth. And, and, 
a lot of that in the kind of aftermath of independence, beginning with the disenfranchisement of um, Indian and Pakistani origin um, residents, right? On the the day, you know, the, the same time as independence is happening, the first act of parliament disenfranchises Indian and Pakistani origin residents. And so in that kind of moment, it's very clear what the nation wants in terms of, you know, um, who gets to be included in the we of the nation. And so then every single kind of decision after that, you see this kind of um, veneer of ethno-nationalism, right? And it's very, um, a Sinhala Buddhist ethno-nationalism, giving, giving Buddhism the primacy in the constitution in the 1970s. You see it with the Sinhala only act with removing Tamil and English from the national registers in terms of languages. And you see the residues of that even today where, you know, I was just commenting, I think maybe two weeks ago, one of the presidential candidates in the parliamentary kind of, you know, um, acting president, you know, election that was held now that Rano Wickramasinghe later won. Um, one of the candidates, you know, released a statement in Singhala that was like, I am here, I'm here. I'm like, you know, people can't read this <laughs> if they're Tamil, right? So are we thinking about, you know, these residues of history where this, this kind of exclusion was happening um, on language, um, on ethnicity, and then the class issue, right, um, is very much a question of, you know, the, the legacy of the plantation, the history and the presence of the plantation sector today, but also informal labor, like domestic work, um, the kind of consolidation of elite classes, whether it's in Colombo, but also thinking of different regions like Jaffna that has their own kind of class histories and caste oppression and, and other form formations of this across and within each ethnicity. So it's, it, it's a very particular history that, you know, um, many outside of Sri Lanka, if they're not familiar with it, can tend to kind of either collapse um, an understanding of caste from India or an understanding of religious diversity from another country within the region. But it's important to see the strains and the threads that, you know, Nira and other historians have so carefully, you know, um, charted um, and to really see that in the living moment of what people experience today it's as they negotiate, right, how to be in community with one another and live alongside one another. So. Yeah, no, I think I think that's that's beautifully um, put, and and you know one of the reasons that um, I found myself so drawn to to your work and to and to Nira's work is I think Nira has a, a line in the introduction to her book Sri Lanka: a, a, a Modern History, right about how problematic it is, right to to sort of read into you know what you just described, right these these you know complex. Um, divisions and, and um, forms of identity and group belonging and how that all relates to the larger national project, weaving caste and class and all that. Um, you know, we can kind of, especially here in the West, we can sort of um, project an understanding of identity onto people who uh, maybe don't necessarily see themselves uh, in that frame. And I think the way that, that Nira puts it, which echoes a lot of what you write about in your book, is that you know, identity isn't always about like how people define themselves as much as it is about what people want for themselves, right? And, and uh, you know, what, how they want to live, right? And and how they are able to live. And that's that's kind of what I wanted to pick up on, right? Because your work focuses on how gender, caste, and and forms of class and labor oppression are sustained by ethno nationalist movements, and and also how different forms of, you know, alliances, solidarities, and, and, and belonging kind of form around ethno-nationalism within Sri Lanka, in the region, and, and across borders, right? So there's a lot of really complex stuff that, that you're navigating in your work. And <clears throat> I wanted to approach kind of both sides of that by contextualizing these important points of focus through the ethnographic research that you've done. Uh, over the past decade and a half, right? Uh, you, you know, again, folks should really just read your book. Um, we're not going to be able to give you all the context that that you need, but um, we'll give you some. And I just can't recommend enough that that you read my three's book, Tea and Solidarity, in which you um, really center the lives and struggles of hill country Tamil women working in the tea fields. Um, you know, but 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 in the you know time that that we have. 
you know, again, if folks want the full story, go read your go read my three's book. But in the time we have here, I wanted to ask if you could sort of give viewers and listeners more of a sense of who and what you are writing about in this book. And, you know, what did living with talking to and, and writing about these Tamil women workers reveal to you about gender, caste, and class oppression in, in modern Sri Lanka? And, and I guess what role do ethno-nationalist movements play in, in solidifying and reproducing these, these systems of oppression. I know that's a lot. So take, take, take whatever is most generative and leave the rest. <laughs> no, I, I, thank you. Yeah. And I, you know, and I think, I think about, you know, what if the book had just been based on one year of field re, field research versus the 10 years, um, you know, that it was. And so, you know, when I did field research originally in 2008, you know, it kind of, it kind of progressed from there. And I think meant much of that over 10 years, really 2008, I was turning in, I think, drafts of the book, having done research in 2018, but had to kind of cut myself off at 2017. But, you know, there was like one part of the conclusion where I do reference something in 2018, because I was observing these mass protests um, at Columbus Golf Race Green, which then became the GGG site of the Aravalia movement um, this year, as we're seeing that, you know, workers were there filling the streets, wearing black, demanding a thousand rupee wage for their parents who were working. These were hill country Tamil um, youth primarily, but also some workers. And it was a very organized protest, peaceful, but was asking very clearly and really cutting up that elite space that was in such a beautiful way. And and so I, I couldn't stop writing because things were happening. And I think uh, what I was interested in in the book was and an very much kind of questions that I think you could apply to other um, communities within Sri Lanka, too, is what kind of unraveling and unpeeling of what people choose to see or choose to not see when they see the plantation. So we could say this about other industries as well. The gem industry, there are you know, wonderful anthropologists and researchers looking at that, um, but also other questions, whether it's rice, you know, paddy fields, right? Any type of um, you know, industry is like when, when we choose to see that salon tea or we hear salon tea, right? Um, and what are we actually understanding of people's lived experiences and the workers who create that commodity? Um, so the title is a little misleading because it's not about tea science. <laughs> I get a lot of questions about tea science, and but also like it's not about the technicalities of fair trade or the industrial kind of sustainability questions in the sector, um, but really who and what allowed the plantation to become what it is today um, and sustained it, as you said. And really through kind of whose bodies did that happen, through whose life story, life stories, kinship, investment, and oppression, right? Who who invested in this oppression um, and who benefited from it? And, and to really see the people who are kind of um, experiencing the brunt of that, but also at the same time, not saying, you know, thinking every day to themselves, you know, I am oppressed because I, I struggle with that type of flattened, um, you know, the flattened type of, um, you know, representation of the worker, um, but someone who is actually kind of just trying to survive and doing everything that they can um, in order to. And so to really look at like the material of that in the house, in what constitutes a home, but um, really to kind of see the, the architecture of that state company industry and kind of policing surveillance of the nation going hand in hand together and to see what the outcome is for people in their lives and their bodies. And so and that's kind of how it really, you know, evolved over time. I think the war ending had a lot to do with the shape that the, the, the narratives took. Obviously there was an opening to talk a little bit more about, you know, these questions um, of nation, but it was also, you know, I was doing field work at a time where there was a lot of change um, and really trying to document that change to see it as a dynamic place and not a fixed place and not a place that's kind of stuck in this like t colonial nostalgia. Um. Yeah. And I, I think again, it's, it's um, one of the reasons why your approach, um, the ethnographic approach is so uh, important, right? Because it's like you said, we, we can really latch on to these sort of larger categorical definitions 
like uh, even in your book, you 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 struggle with calling you know the the people and communities that you're studying the hill country Tamil women workers or tea workers because you're trying to show it's like well there's so much more than that right or or a lot of them don't want to work in the tea fields or they want to do other things with their lives and may and they may not even be as as sort of closely identified with the place and the kind of work that they do but that's where that sort of you could almost say dialectical struggle right between the human yearning for a good dignified life for oneself and one's family and a sense of belonging in a country, in a region um, where people's lives aren't under threat. Um, there's a struggle between that and these larger historically built systems of oppression, gender oppression, class, caste oppression. So I was wondering if if we could just tease that out a, a little bit more in, in maybe you know one of the stories that you write about or, or some of the folks that you talk to about kind of how you approach that sort of struggle between uh, the individual and these systems of oppression um, and that, that you know, like, like you said, makes makes this um, story more dynamic than, than maybe folks would from the outside might think. Yeah. You know, and like, I think that, you know, the, that gender caste class nexus, and it really is kind of hedged in together. It, it was so easy to locate when I started doing research. It's everywhere, right? It's almost like it's just, you know, permeating the space and the politics, um, NGOs. Um, it's so, you know, to, to, for context, most plantation unions are led by men, and the largest one is led by a caste dominant patriline, right? So, starting with the grandfather, and this is reference to Thundaman Salon Workers Congress, to um, you know the the grandson or the son who then passed away in 2020, and now his his son, right? And so, and that kind of upholding of gender inequality, caste oppression, and class inequalities, I think, comes so clearly in the way that women were kind of brought into the union. So I've talked to a lot of women, for instance, that, you know, began their union leadership in wings, right? This idea that a women's wing had to be kind of allocated, you get a wing, right? Um, and they were always separated from the broader seats of power, the, the more kind of forms of leadership, like, you know, general secretary and so forth. And but the troubling thing of this was that most of the political uh, unions were also political parties. And so when you track the ethno nationalism happening, you have to also take in the union and the labor movement that's happening in the 1920s onwards and their quest for citizenship after they were disenfranchised. So you see that kind of politics of patronage, because if they're centralizing power in an executive presidency. If you know a majoritarian government is in power, you have to make alliances with that majoritarian government. So it becomes a politics of patronage. Um, and in talking to people about the decisions they have to make while navigating that, it's very clear that you know a wage struggle. Um, there was a really beautiful like um, sign that came out during the 2009 collective wage agreement. That was like, you know, is this a, you know, because it's called the, you know, a wage struggle, but in Tamil, it's like, is this a, is this a folk dance, right? And then it's a, a play on the Tamil word for kutum, and then like, so it's a really interesting um, sign that just like, is this a wage struggle or is it a folk dance, right? And so, because it, it sounds very similar, there's just one syllable that's different, and so these kinds of references, like, there's no faith in what these kind of um, empty gestures are um, to 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 get this wage up by like an increment to a thousand to this um it's not a living wage right people can't live on it um so they're going to do other things to live um and i think that was what was the most telling to me um you know in terms of a story right i you know i just remember i think this was in like chapter two or three you know talking to a woman who had plucked 14 15 days of the month and, you know, because of informal debts and because of deductions on that wage, she should have made something like 10,000, 6,000 rupees, which at the time would have been okay. She made 60 rupees, 
right? And so, you know, she crumbled it up. And I remember she threw it across the room. And she's like, what's that going to get me a biscuit for my child? Right? Um, so, you know, this kind of like, you know, anger, right? But also not knowing, um, you know, knowing that you're working so hard, but you're living in debt. Um, and debt is something that I think now, you know, post war, the North and East, there's, there's huge issues with debt right now in microfinance and loans. But um, the plantation sector has long kind of, you know, um, had this concern about kind of basically writing in debt into the wage, right? You write it into the wage and it's company driven. Um, yeah. And I think so those are the types of things that they're they're messy because people have, you know, we want unions, we want, you know, labor struggles, we want political rights and political representation, but it comes with strings. Um, and those strings have ties to ethno-nationalism, ties to this wealth accumulation, and and other kinds of negotiations. Like, when does the plantation worker matter? It's going to be a, a question of, like, if, is there enough space for it at the moment on the national, re like, stage? And oftentimes there is not. So... Yeah. And I mean, I think, um, you know, again, one, one of the things that really started to take shape for me reading your book, right, it was how, you know, obviously here at The Real News and on my, my podcast, Working People, I focus very intently on the lives and struggles of workers in North America, but increasingly beyond. And I think one of the things that really comes through is that um, labor organizations or even, you know, non-formal movements of workers uh, in and across sectors, right? This is one essential engine for working people to drive, you know, that change. Like you said, to to demand a place in um, the list of society's uh, political priorities. Um, but I think uh, I, I, we, we unfortunately don't have time to kind of get into, say, like the trajectory of the organized labor movement in Sri Lanka. Um, but I think I would highly recommend that folks, if you do check out Maithri's book, read about uh, her time working with um, you know, members of the Working Women's Front, which I thought was was very, very interesting to read. But it's like, you know, I mentioned at the top that I focus more on Mexican history and politics. I can see some of that happening there as well, right? Like, if organized labor is a mechanism through which working people kind of assert their needs and priorities within a kind of hegemonic um, system that is dominated by political elites, business elites, that has a sort of racial hierarchy, gender hierarchy built into that, you can see, in fact, how the organized labor movement in Mexico was sort of colonized by those larger structural forces, right? The, the, the corrupt unions were essentially in bed with those very same business and political elites. They weren't representing the interests of working people uh, and, and, you know, of different ethnicities and, and genders and so on and so forth, which is what makes uh, victories like the recent um, independent union at the GM plant in Silao, Mexico, where workers first threw off their corrupt, you know, business union, and then they voted for a wholly new independent union to represent them. Like that is a struggle for better representation within a system that is trying to cons consolidate and control how much working people actually have agency in that. Right. Is So I just, I wanted to ask, like, is that kind of how you're, 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 you're describing this for, for folks watching and listening that like, that even within like organized labor in Sri Lanka, such that it is right, those same historical kind of forces of hierarchy and oppression really limit what working people like the Hill Country Tamil women are able to do through those organizations. Yeah. You know, I think it's it's so telling that, you know, yeah, you know, people will at the union level be struggling for things like the wage or a daily wage. And this is just the base wage, right? Um, and, you know, thinking about, you know, how that gets structured into private companies and then negotiated with ministries of plantation industries and so forth. Um, and I think a telling example is that, like, you know, they got the thousand rupee wage last year. Um, 
in, I was it April, right? Um, but in December of last year, and I, I, I linger on this, you know, story because I can't stop thinking about it was that Christmas Eve last year, the government of Sri Lanka, you know, announced that its Ministry of Plantation Industries had signed an MOU with the Ministry of Industries, Mine and Trade in Iran to settle its $250 million U.S. dollar debt from the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation to the National Iranian Oil Company. So you're probably like, where does the plantation fit into this? Because the settlement actually outlined that Sri Lanka would begin sending Iran $5 million worth of tea each month to pay back its debt. So, you know, these things are happening and it's decided on by the ministries and by the government that this is a mutually beneficial economic relationship. It's going to resolve debt. Iran gets their commodity. Everyone has a really good relationship in terms of diplomacy. But, you know, at that level, who's plucking that tea? Right. Um, and they can't even, you know, be in line to get a gas cylinder to cook with. They can't have to take off days of work. They're not going to get that thousand rupee wage. This is the massive inequality of, you know, unions not even being able to negotiate at that level of the ministry making a decision for their workers. It's just like your commodity, your labor is going to go to paying back the country's debts. And, and so these are the kinds of, you know, state industrial entanglements that are really hard to un you know, tease out because it's, it, no one is actually, the decision-making power is not in the workers' hands. Um, and so it's heartening to see unions, particularly across sectors coming together in the Aravalia movement, but also to kind of see that, but also recognizing that the state right now, this week particularly, is attacking and arresting, you know, union leaders that were physically um, very visible in the in the movement, were documented, and really, um, you know, really taking that state of emergency um, arbitrary arrest into into practice. So unions, again, this happened during the general strike in 1980, right, where you saw a crushing of labor movements after the general strike. And that was a really powerful moment in 1980. And then you just saw the crushing of it by the state forces under the PTA or Prevention of Terrorism Act. So it's, it, you know, it kind of makes you wonder where that wealth, you know, who gets to make those decisions. And it's, it's, it's very trying to see, I think, the, the current government and the current president, Ranel Wickremesinga, just hunting down union leaders, arresting them, um, you know, and also priests um, to students. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, so this is kind of what I think the people are up against and the worker is up against. Um, and it's happened again and again, you know, so even before, you know, these more nationwide protests, you know, there were protests against wages, um, wage theft, but also mistreatment by management on a plantation called Alton Estate um, during the pandemic. Um, and, you know, 38 women were sacked and, and fired and then they were put in jail without bond um, and they were jailed for protesting and going to the management and demanding, um, you know, their wages. And so they were no union came to help them at that time. <laughs> you know, they remained in jail for a number of days during a pandemic. And so it kind of makes you wonder, like, where is there, um, you know, space to actually do the work of standing up for workers um, in, in that kind of hedged in structure? Yeah, yeah, again, I think that's that's really uh, perfectly and, and harrowingly put. And, and you know, I wanted to, to kind of pick up on. Yeah, you mentioned this this kind of these these entanglements, right, between you know the Sri Lankan state and and other states, right, and and kind of how um, ethno nationalism plays into that, right. So so let let's drill down on the ethno nationalism question for a second, um, and how viewers and listeners should understand its role in the crisis that is unfolding right now. Right. As, as I mentioned in the previous um, question, your your work examines the alliances and solidarities that form around ethno-nationalist movements within Sri Lanka, in the region and across borders. And again, if, if we're focusing on particular moments that give sort of human form to these big forces, I think that there's a, actually a really fascinating moment that you wrote about recently uh, for the Society for Cultural Anthropology. And you write, quote, 
May 12th, 2017 was Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's second official visit to Sri Lanka, but the first any Indian premier would make to the island's hill country after Sri Lanka's independence, end quote. Can you talk a bit about that moment and why it was significant that Modi went to speak to the Tamil people in hill country? And what what do you think that that moment re- might reveal for viewers and listeners about those complex relationships within Sri Lanka and and across its borders that are that are sort of mediated through ethno nationalism. Yeah, you know, I was I was drawn to that moment and to writing about it partly because the you know 2017 was the 150 year um, you know jubilee celebration of the tea industry. So across the industry, there were these massive celebrations. Um, the Commonwealth visit had also happened recently with Prince Charles visiting a plantation, and I later went there to just to kind of see how they memorialized it. You know, his spoon that he used, that silver, is encased in glass in Mapwood's estate. Right, he was garlanded by workers. He was taking all these photographs. Um, this was happening, and at the same time as these celebrations were happening, community organizers, activists were saying they st- workers still don't have land and housing rights. Like, what are you doing, right? Um, so there was this kind of like momentum when Modi um, announced his visit that he was going to come to Sri Lanka. Um, and I thought about it partly because I had interviewed an older unionist who has since passed. Um, she was a woman unionist of the Salon Indian Congress, um, Workers Congress. And she had actually escorted Nehru and Indira Gandhi to um, during the 1950 51 Commonwealth um, you know visit, and so they actually didn't go to the hill country, but actually people from the hill country went to the capital. So there wasn't like this visit, you know. So it was an interesting moment, and I was thinking about Modi making the trip to the hill country, and I was watching the live tweets. I was watching, you know, him tweeting from his car, watching the workers. Um, they rolled out a red carpet, right, um, for him to speak on, you know, Norwood grounds, which is this huge kind of um, sporting grounds. And he gave this really um, powerful speech, and it was very much glowingly received by the audience that attended in the rain. And it was, um, it's on YouTube, you can watch it. And so I was watching this, and it was a spe- speech spoken in English, because he doesn't speak Tamil fluently. And, and you know, in the speech, he's reciting some Tamil lines of poetry from ancient Tamil poets. He's talking about how the workers, you know, how India beats in the hearts of workers. And, you know, with a line of Sri Lankan hill country Tamil politicians behind him, watching him on stage and kind of standing by and watching. And it was a it was a moment where he's referencing, you know, the patriline of Thondaman. He's referencing all the great things that Hill Country Thumbles have done to create the backbone of the nation. And it was this moment that I think, you know, in the moment I was thinking, you know, no one is questioning and no one is talking about the the rampant anti-Muslim violence that Modi has been practicing and evidenced brutality of, of against Muslims in India. No one was talking about that, yet there was a parallel anti-Muslim sentiment and increasing violence against Muslims in Sri Lanka. Um, and, and no one was really talking about caste. No one was talking about these different histories of violence between India and Sri Lanka through the civil war with the Indian peacekeeping forces and their own violence within the country um, and, and different types of relationships. And so there's this kind of like really powerful kind of restoring of relationships through the bodies of the workers um, and through their reception of Modi. And I think, you know, at the time, Sri Lanka and India were negotiating gifts from India to pay for the the building of houses on the estates um, that that would be kind of Modi gifted houses, right? That workers could then live in and say, I have a house and I don't live in a line room. And so I was thinking, you know, it's worrying on one hand because all of that violence was being kind of um, pushed to the side in place of a gift, in place of this restored relationship, this special association that Modi has with tea because he has a history of selling tea on a chai card. Um, And then it's also this kind of alchemy, 
right? This kind of um, chemical almost experience of, you know, um, what's, what are we willing to like forget and let, let dissolve into the air, but then also it's going to stay there um, in terms of our allegiances. And so I was really, you know, drawn to it, to write about it, but also to help people really think about these flexes of, of power, um, that were taking place, right? Um, very much on the ground, um, and for people to receive. So. Yeah, no, I think that was, um, and we'll, we'll link to the, the piece that, that you wrote about it, uh, for sure. And, and I, I guess just to, to, again, like really make sure that, that folks watching and listening, like understand, um, you know, I, I imagine it's come through in, in part one and part two of this extended conversation, right? But, but Tamil, uh, you know, people and, and workers are, are kind of very much coded as kind of, you know, uh, uh, people from mainland India, right? Yes. Yeah. They, and, and, you know, when Modi said, you know, India beats in your hearts, but your, your home is now Sri Lanka, but India beats in your hearts. And he referred to them as diaspora. I think that's important to kind of, again, like, you know, set them apart, but also this idea that, you know, you have an obligation. It's like a tying, almost like of a thread to use the cast term, right? This like thread of, you know, you are bound to us, right? Through kin, through history. That's a history of violence. It's a history of indenture. It's a history of labor exploitation. Um, and, you know, this is very much well documented in the archive. So, yeah. So, um, you know, I could, I could, I could talk to you about this for days, but I know that I've got to let you go in a minute. So I wanted to, um, kind of like by way of rounding out, right. Again, taking that sort of focus on particular moments, I wanted to, to kind of finish with, with another question about an interesting moment that you mentioned, uh, again, in the preface to your book that really caught my eye, right? So you write in Tian Solidarity, quote, Two weeks after the war ended, I was in Colombo for a meeting of Sri Lankan intellectuals and concerned citizens who had gathered to discuss the post-war state of affairs, end quote. So the, the scene that you describe there is, is understandably very tense, right? Because like you said, you're two weeks after the end of the Civil War, and I think you even write about like how a white van pulled up outside of where y'all were meeting and everyone kind of closed up because the association of people disappearing in those types of vans for 30 years, you know, was understandably on everyone's mind. Um, but, and so, yeah, just like, you know, with, with decades of living in a state of emergency, you have a great line. I, I forget how you put it, but it's like, um, like the everyday embodiments of emergency, right? The way that people lived for 30 years in the civil war, but with that kind of thing still very much weighing on all of you, uh, and on the country itself at that moment in 2009, um, you know, there, there was still also, as, as I understood it, uh, you know, a sense of possibility and, and even hope for the post-war period. And, you know, as we're seeing right now, and as has, you know, I think been clear uh, even before people stormed the, um, you know, president's um, building, you know, those hopes from 2009 uh, have, have not been realized for many people in the country. So again, by way of rounding out our discussion, I wanted to ask if you could sort of take us back to that meeting of, of minds, right? The intellectuals, the concerned citizens, this coming together in the wake of the end of the civil war, you know, what were y'all discussing at that point? And, and what were the real and palpable hopes for Sri Lanka and its people at that moment? And I guess, how would you compare that moment to now, like what kinds of discussions are being had and uh, who's having them and, and what sort of hope do you see for Sri Lanka at this moment in time? Yeah, I, you know, that meeting was, you know, it was in the capital and it, you know, yes, the white van did come up and I remember the kind of nervousness, the nervous laughter after it turned off its lights and we realized it was just a regular van. <laughs> um, we were, we were talking it was almost like it was a sharing of knowledge. It was a sharing of, you know, what is actually happening in the North, um, particularly someone had visited the IDP camps and was giving us a report. Um, it was sharing information about because there was no access, um, limited access. So on one hand, we were talking about the euphoria around the military victory, um, the deep militarization of the country in the North and East, but also the kind of hegemonic uh, 
control of like the the euphoria around the militarization in the south um so we were talking about freedom of press to report on idps um about disappearances we were talking about the 40 detention centers and how only icrc had access to about like 10,000 individuals of like the you know hundreds of thousands um you know there were 100 to 200 families you know using one toilet right in the idp camps at this time and so this was really, you know, questions of sexual assaults, detentions. We were talking about all of this and and in that talking about the silence of Columbus elites. You know, why were people silent about what was happening, even though they knew um, the decimation of like civil society in the North and East, how to kind of get that back. And, and I remember that, you know, I looked back to my notes before we were speaking and I remember there was a particular, um, you know, time where people were saying we need to work across ethnic class and caste lines to not stand still and just carry on like nothing's happening. And someone said something really um, telling in that meeting, and I had written it down. It says history has taken over us, and it's this idea that you know at that moment, right? I mean, I think just seeing the last five months and year of protests, um, they've been silent protests, as Nira said, and kind of more um, quieter pockets of protest over the year. But the last five months, you know, really seeing people confront that silence and um, acknowledge it, take um, accountability for it, and to take up those kinds of um, really very cons- like very um, strong actions towards collaboration and repair, and also giving space to minorities at the site, but also beyond that. And it's not perfect, right? Um, and I think, you know, and being outside of Colombo, I'm not able to speak on the internal dynamics, but just kind of seeing on social media that it's, you know, it's every day is changing. Um, I'm thinking that, you know, people are very clearly aware now of that sentiment that we were holding at that time, this idea of history taking over and this idea that, you know, minorities are not only being hunted by the state, but now anyone who's against the state will be hunted. Um, And that the state really didn't have everyone's back. um, And that that kind of, um, you know, that kind of assurance that we would never be harmed is actually, um, you know, not going to be it can't, you can't count on it, right? Um, that the state police power is there. So I think th- there's a lot of this kind of reckoning that's happening, but it's also um, those notes were really telling at the time that people really didn't know what to do. And I think this is a moment we should be looking at. Um, and it's, I, I have some hope um, in terms of the types of you know relationships that I'm seeing and the types of things coming out of the people's struggle. Well, that is Maithri Jagathesan, Assistant Professor of Anthropology at Santa Clara University and author of the essential book, Tea and Solidarity, Tamil Women and Work in Postwar Sri Lanka. Maithri, thank you so much for coming on today and for sharing your brilliance and insight so generously with us. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Max, and for inviting me. For everyone watching, this is Maximilian Alvarez. Before you go, please head on over to therealnews.com forward slash support. Become a monthly sustainer of our work so we can keep bringing you important coverage and conversations just like this. We hope that this two-part deep dive into the unfolding crisis in Sri Lanka, tracing the roots of that crisis, Uh, has been helpful for you all. And if you want to see more conversations like this, please write in and let us know and we will, you know, follow up and and do more of them. But, um, you know, thank you so much for watching and listening. And a special thanks to professors uh, Nira Wickramasinga and Maithri Jagathesan for coming on and giving us so much of their time and insight. And thank you all again for watching. Solidarity forever.